welcome everyone. Um, we're going to wait a few minutes um, so that we allow people the opportunity to hop onto the call. And so I'll just kind of orient you to um, our town hall today. Um, the legislature concluded uh, on Monday of this week, and obviously it was a very unusual session, uh, a little un, uh, not ordinary, I should say. Uh, so today, and as per our tradition at the end of our session, we typically uh, do somewhat of a, a wrap up and we uh, bring in journalists to be able to provide to us their perspective of what it was like covering the Capitol, um, some of their insights about what it's like to be a journalist following politics at the Capitol. And in particular, I'm, I'm really interested this year how things were different uh, from prior sessions. And so we will at some point uh, get to our panelists and they will each introduce themselves, uh, tell which a publication or media outlet that they work for, a little bit about their backgrounds, and then um, they're going to offer up just a brief uh, summary of some of the, the highlights from their point of view. We will have an opportunity for people to write in questions, um, and we will answer those questions live. We'll, we'll pitch them over to our panelists so that they can address your questions. And right now, while we are waiting for everybody to get on, um, what I'll say is uh, welcome. And my name is State Senator Rachel Zenzinger, and I represent Senate District 19, which is Arvada and Westminster, all in Jefferson County. And I have with me today my, my co-hosts, and I'll turn it over to them so that they can introduce themselves as well. Uh, we'll start with Representative Tracy Kraftart. Hi there, Tracy Kraftart. I'm the State Representative in House District 29 which is North and East Arvada, the Jefferson County part of Westminster. And I also am a candidate for Jefferson County Commissioner in District 1. And I'll go next. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Brianna Tatone. I represent District 27. Uh, that's mostly just Arvada, west of Wadsworth and Olds Wadsworth, uh, and uh, running for my second term uh, this November, so I'll be on the ballot. Great, so um, a couple of things I'm reading here in the Q&A. Uh, I just wanna point you all to the Q&A that um, some of the participants are only able to see two of the panelists. Um, I'm not sure which two are, are on your screen, but <laughs> I hope it's me, no. <laughs> um, so we do have uh, the little question and answer um, component um, and you can uh, type in your questions there and if it is a specific question to one person, we'll type in the answer and if it is a, a question to the panelists today, um, then one of them uh, will answer it live. And then we'll also give an opportunity for other panelists to respond to those questions as well. Um, as per usual, we usually end up with far more questions than we're able to address. Um, and we apologize for that. We'll try to get to as many as possible. Um, I'm gonna offer up just a very quick uh, preview, uh, wrap up of, of um, the legislative session from my perspective. Uh, we uh, obviously, when we started back in January, uh, our session looked to be pretty normal, pretty typical. And then with the emergence of the coronavirus, uh, things took a turn very dramatically. Uh, we paused our session uh, in um, the beginning of March and uh, we uh, obeyed the stay-at-home order, uh, just like everybody else, um, for the next eight weeks or so. Um, during that time, I know that many legislators were not at home just kicking it and sitting by the fire and, and reading books. Uh, we were uh, hosting uh, town halls, um, writing uh, newsletters, um, trying to get uh, at answers from constituents about uh, safety concerns, um, unemployment concerns, um, and any number of, of issues that cropped up as a result of the virus. I know as a Joint Budget Committee member, um, my job also changed very dramatically. Um, at the beginning of the year, back in January, it looked like we were going to be about $800 million, a minimum of $500 million over the Tabor cap. 
um, which was going to be the, uh, a first time for us in, in many years where we will have would have expended all of the money to pay for the senior property homestead tax exemption. Uh, we would have uh, then triggered the next step of reducing uh, the, the tax uh, percentage amount. And then we were still going to be over uh, enough to where we were going to be refunding uh, Tabor refunds uh, to um, uh, constituents. So uh, that was January. And then in March, uh, just about a week, well, I think it was the Monday. It actually was. It was the Monday after our our emergency Saturday session where um, we, we put everything on pause, uh, the situation had changed to where we were approximately $25 million over. And then um, uh, between that uh, first week of March to uh, when we resumed, uh, we plummeted $3.3 billion. So it was a pretty dramatic um, change uh, and it was, very difficult trying to figure out how we were going to um, make up that revenue, uh, make up that, that budget deficit. It was the greatest deficit that we've seen in our state's history of all of our prior recessions combined. Um, so we did many of the things that prior legislatures have done in the past to be able to address budget uh, shortages, but that didn't even come close to what we had to do this time. So it was uh, a very stressful time. Um, the Joint Budget Committee started meeting about three weeks in advance of the legislature convening uh, to go through uh, the budget steps and unwind all of the decisions that we had already made since uh, really November. The, the Joint Budget Committee started working in November on the budget. So we had to start over and in a three week period, rewrote the budget to account for the 25% reduction and then uh, presented that to our colleagues uh, when the session reconvened three weeks ago, just a little over three weeks ago. So um, as part of that, uh, I, I will say that um, no particular area of the state budget went untouched, uh, but we tried very hard to prioritize um, education uh, to make sure that we could minimize the cuts to education to the best of our ability. And I'm really um, pleased that we have uh, Erica Meltzer joining us today with Chalkbeat, who might be able to give us some perspective on that. Um, in addition to that, a lot of the priorities that we uh, started off um, wanting to accomplish this session were also rolled back because of cost. Um, anything that had a fiscal note was essentially uh, um, postponed indefinitely and did not move forward. And then uh, we moved forward a series of COVID related bills that are really meant to help address uh, some of the uh, lingering uh, impacts of COVID to our economy and to our healthcare system. And uh, that package of legislation was primarily funded through the CARES Relief Act uh, money that uh, we received from the federal government. So, um, the three weeks time that we were in the legislature, um, that was our focus, uh, passing the state budget, uh, passing the School Finance Act, uh, picking up the COVID related bills, and then also um, making a point of eliminating or postponing the bills that we were just not able to move forward with um, at, at this time. And we strove to keep the session short. Um, we still had, um, I, I think we ended on day 80 or something, so we still had uh, a number of days left from our 120-day uh, session, but uh, because of the health concerns and because we continued well after when uh, we ordinarily wrap up, um, we uh, made a commitment to try and, and uh, do an abbreviated uh, re session. <laughs> I'm, I'm not even sure what to call it anymore, <laughs> uh, the, the, the post-recess session. <laughs> um, I think I read somewhere, this was not mine, I, I know I read it somewhere, but it was kind of like a, a tale of two sessions. Um, it was the worst of times, it was the best of times, and, uh, and, and the two sessions really were very different from one another, um, pre and post-COVID. So, um, that's my update uh, for today, and I'm happy to um, pass it over to uh, Representative Traf Kraftharp to also give a little bit of a perspective. Um, it was her last session, 
So um, I definitely want an opportunity for, for Tracy to, to maybe talk about it from that perspective. And then uh, we will uh, wrap up with uh, Representative Chatone, who is in the process of moving. So she may keep her, her uh, uh, wrap up a little brief, and then we will move on to our, our panelists. So Tracy. So yes, last Monday was my last day in session. Maybe um, unless the governor calls us back in, then I we could have some more. So we never know if that will happen. Um, Jesse is uh, saying no. Um, so Jesse probably knows uh, something. So that's good. Um, so uh, after eight years, I'm termed out. And so um, finishing this up, it was an interesting session to have as your last session. I can't even tell you how many bills I had this year. I could tell you I had some amazing bills that just died on the calendar. And I've got some great bills that um, got postponed until December 31st. And it's very sad. Um, I will tell you, I have a bill that had a $2,000 fiscal note that um, got put aside. Um, not very happy, not happy girl. Um, so I think probably um, when we came back, um, I picked up um, a bill to fund behavioral health care through uh, the CARES dollars. Um, that bill will be signed on Monday morning at 9.30, um, as, well, um, as well as the whole package of the CARES bills. But I really want to um, give us a chance to be able to get to the reporters. So um, I, I'll just say that we, that we introduced 427 bills in the House, 224 bills in the Senate, uh, 88 of those bills were introduced in the last 16 days of the session. And with that, uh, maybe we could get to Brianna and then to our reporters. Thanks. Yeah, I'm, I'm sitting down, so I have a chance here. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, yeah, this was such an interesting year because last year was normal more or less you know i mean i'm new here so i don't know what normal is i don't want this to be the new normal for sure uh it was it was kind of crazy but um you know uh, my team and i we really shifted gears to work on constituent needs and uh we addressed a lot of things i mean we put out weekly newsletters throughout the whole entire time we were away um i think the House Democrats had a hundred um, town halls in just the time that we were uh, off. So there was uh, a lot of communication being done to, to help people understand what the new rules were, what the, how things were going, what the, what the status was. And we're gonna continue to do that through the summer. Uh, the COVID situation's not done yet. We still have uh, states around us that are increasing in their cases so i want to make sure we can keep our cases down so we can keep business as usual here or as usual as it will be um, i had a few bills that were were killed that i was disappointed about as well um, one of them was my uh, human decomposition bill i was i didn't really have a fiscal note and they still killed it anyway i'm really really upset about that because it was very bipartisan um, but we'll, we'll have to bring that one back. I, th I think that was a business opportunity here for Colorado in, uh, in our recovery, but uh, so be it. And uh, I had a couple other bills that were, um, that actually were killed and then we, we were bringing them back right at the last minute. And that was, one of those was 1113. That one was about mental health education resources, trying to get mental health uh, access to people and actually push it out. And that bill had a huge fiscal note, but uh, we found another bill that was killed earlier that also had a fiscal note, and it was around safe to tell. Uh, and we, we brought that back with the help of Mo Keller. Uh, she helped uh, eliminate the parts of the fiscal note that we didn't need. And uh, I ended up with a new sponsor for the bill, uh, Assistant Minority Leader Van Winkle, and we uh, brought that bill back and we, uh, we got the safe to tell. Uh, changes in. So, uh, you know, we try to be as adaptable as we can and 
uh, pivot and change with the situation. And, we, and I think we did a pretty good job about that. And we'll let our reporters uh, make that final determination. So thanks. Thank you. So we'll go ahead and start. Um, we'll, we'll kick it off first with um, Jesse Paul from the Colorado Sun. Um, if you'll just introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about the publication that you work for, and then um, share with us uh, kind of some of the highlights and, and lowlights of, of the session from your perspective. Jesse. Sure. Uh, thanks. Thanks so much, Senator. Um, I'm Jesse Paul. I'm a reporter at the Colorado Sun. I cover politics and uh, a lot of other stuff right now, a lot of coronavirus um, and kind of social unrest issues. Um, uh, this was my third legislative session and uh, my second for the Sun. Uh, if you don't know about the Colorado Sun, we were formed um, in the summer of 2018 out of the turmoil at the Denver Post. Um, uh, me and nine of my colleagues decided to uh, form our own news outlet uh, and build it from scratch based off of frustrations with what was going on at the Post. And we were, we were really tired of seeing our colleagues uh, be let go. So um, we created this, this news outlet and we're in our second year. So it's been a fun adventure. Um, and we've worked hard to, to kind of build up something and, and become a, a voice in the state. Um, this session was, was interesting for so many reasons. I mean, one of them was, um, uh, sorry, I'm getting distracted by Representative Chatone's picture of Andy. I don't know. <laughs> um, uh, uh, you know, this session was really moving pretty smoothly compared to last year, which was one of the wildest sessions people could remember on memory. Um, and then coronavirus hit and kind of threw everything into a tizzy and, and it happened just as um, Democrats in the legislature are about to introduce some really big policies that are pretty controversial, including uh, public health insurance option, paid family leave, things that were significantly going to change the state and have a lot of uh, big fights ahead. So when we came back, obviously those things had all been sidelined. I don't think we really knew what to expect. I think we thought it was going to be pretty calm. And then, oh, you know, right away as everyone got back, you know, the news about George Floyd broke and things changed dramatically. So. Um, you know, I think a high point was being able to see a piece of policy as big as Senate Bill 217 passed so quickly. I think there was a lot of concerns about um, that going, moving too quickly to the extent where there would be a lot of problems with it. And, you know, a lot of law enforcement Republicans were, were raising concerns about that. But, you know, within two or three days, those had pretty much evaporated. Um, so it was, it, was, it was very cool to be a part of watching that piece of policy pass through, get so much support and then be there actually yesterday for the historic signing of it was, was a pretty powerful moment too. So um, I'll hand it over to whoever's next. Great, thank you. Um, why don't we go to Andrew Kinney of CPR News. There we you're go. Still, you're still muted, there you go. Now you can hear me. Yeah, I'm Andy, uh, I'm with Colorado Public Radio, joined them just over seven or eight months ago. And this was actually my first session, first year on the radio and first year with CPR. So it was a uh, bamboozling for me. It was, it was a, quite chaotic. So I ended up having to learn how the legislature works while also being remote and watching a lot of it over the Colorado Channel, great resource, and some of the, uh, the other remote technologies that they use. And it was, it was quite challenging and it showed me how difficult it probably can be for a member of the public to completely understand what's going on at any time. But it was also kind of, uh, it was nice to know that it could be done remotely. You know, if you have the resources and you're willing to spend some time figuring out where all the different video and documents live, you can get a pretty good idea of what's going on in the ledge from your own home in Eastern Arvada, as, as I am right now. I'm actually in Reptitone's district. Um, I spent a lot of my time focusing on the budget, watching Senator Zenzinger in the Joint Budget Committee. Um, I focused on eviction, housing, unemployment system, and that'll be my focus for the next few months going forward as well. So kind of got my, my arms around it by the end of it, but boy, it was chaotic and it started moving very fast at the end. Great, thank you. And our last panelist today is Erica Meltzer. Erica, we'll uh, hand it over to you. 
Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Erica Meltzer. I'm the Bureau Chief for Chalkbeat Colorado. We're a nonprofit online news organization that exclusively covers education issues. Um, you can find us at co.chalkbeat.org and our work is republished in outlets around the state, including in the Colorado Sun and the Denver Post. This is my fourth session, uh, my second for Chalkbeat. No, my third for Chalkbeat. No, my third for Chalkbeat. And, um, I also ended up covering it mostly remotely. I have two school-aged children who um, came home when the schools closed, and so I had to balance uh, work and remote learning, as I'm sure many of you had to as well. Um, everyone survived. <laughs> um, and so this session, yeah, as, as has been referenced, when, when we started in January, people had a very different idea of the types of things that we were going to be working on. Um, there were efforts to address teacher shortage, to improve college access. There was parent advocacy groups um, for students with disabilities trying to improve how their, you know, kids, how their kids were served in school. And then you had the uh, Colorado Education Association had a teacher pay bill that was very important to them. And we're pushing for a buy down of the negative factor. And of course, all of that got um, blown up. And in the second half of the session, I think we were really focused like it was, it was just about money. Like that was when you don't have money, <laughs> that's really all you can think about. So I know in the K-12 world, people really feel like education is underfunded and they're not wrong about that. But K-12 also takes up a huge percentage of the budget. It takes up 36% of the general fund. And we had a 25% reduction in the general fund. So you can see how that math doesn't work out. Um, and as grim as this session was in terms of um, having to make cuts, um, obviously a big reduction in the amount of state money going to schools. We also saw a lot of um, a lot of grant programs that have been that have been passed in recent years also got suspended and defunded. Um, um, big a lot of money was taken out of the best program, which supports school construction. A lot of things had to be done to just to balance the budget. At the same time, I feel like this session allowed some conversations to really come to the forefront that had been brewing in the background for a long time around these really deep underlying problems in school finance. And I feel like this, even though we're a long way from solving these, next year also has the potential to be very bad. Um, and voters have to make certain decisions in November to head off some of those bad things for next year and they may they'll they'll make whatever decision they make but it felt to me like these conversations that had been brewing in the background and had never been brought forward because it was not super politically convenient to talk about them all of a sudden they like, had to be talked about and the school finance act contains a really interesting property tax change that i won't talk about because it'll take the whole rest of the session but um yeah, this is potentially like really game changing stuff that lays the groundwork for some big changes down the road on some problems that have been a long time in the making. And so it was a really interesting, it was a really interesting session. Yeah, I struggled to find the right adjective to describe the session. <laughs> interesting, definitely one of them. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we'll, we'll start with our questions. And the first question has to do with uh, the uh, police accountability work. Um, so this uh, speaker says, I'm enormously impressed by the police accountability work. Uh, what are the remaining issues in your view? So um, uh, why don't we uh, start with uh, Jesse, since uh, you mentioned it in your opening um, that you sort of tracked that issue. Uh, what do you think is, is um, still outstanding? Um, I think there's a few things. Uh, you know, this, this bill tackled a lot, but there were, there were kind of three issues that I think there, there, there's one issue that I think will come from this. There's one that I think could arise, and then there's another one that they didn't really tackle. Um, one was, I know Representative Leslie Harrod, a Denver Democrat, who was one of the people who sponsored the bill, really wanted to push an aspect of this bill that gave the Colorado Attorney General's Office the ability to investigate uh, law enforcement involved deaths and take it out of the hands of district attorneys so it would be kind of a statewide pool. I know that there was a little bit of trepidation from the Attorney General's office to take that on, given the cost and you know their expertise um, and ability to do this, because these these shootings or or deaths or whatever happens often are investigated like homicides. So police departments are are maybe best suited to do that. 
Um, so I'm curious to see if that comes at a later time. I know that didn't get added into this bill and, and I think that's something that will come down the road. Something that I think could be an issue from this bill is um, body cameras and the funding that police departments across the state, uh, you know, the amount of money that it's gonna take to implement the requirement that every officer has a body camera. Uh, you know, there are so many small two or three man police departments in Colorado that people don't think about and towns that don't have the money to do that. And, and remember, these are officers who are making $25,000, $30,000 a year. So they don't have enough money to pay for their officers and body cameras can be quite expensive. So I think that's an, an arising issue that some people uh, try to kind of flag as the bill was making it through. And then the third one is the personal liability for officers that was part of this bill. Originally it was about $100,000 per officer and then it was dropped down to $25,000 as part of the negotiations. And you know, opponents of the bill or people who had issues with it said, one of the issue, one of the problems that could arise is you, you know, you, you potentially could bankrupt a police officer or make it, um, you know, unreasonable for them to work in law enforcement by having such a high cap on their personal liability. Um, but twenty five thousand dollars, I think, leaves it open for insurance to cover these things. So I don't know if it, if if that if moving the threshold down to that level will have the same effect. And it'll be interesting to see as this bill goes into effect and lawsuits start up to see. You know what kind of effect it's going to have on officers and if it's going to hurt them or if it's just going to be kind of nullified by police union insurance policies or, or an officer's personal insurance policy so i'm not sure if that will have the intended effect but that's something that we'll definitely be following up on so erica i'm wondering if um one of the impacts to schools um with 217 is the movement for like dps for example to sever ties with um, their SROs. Um, do you have a, a perspective on that? Yeah, I mean, this is something that some, certain community groups have been calling for for a long time. And then, all, and then because of the protests and the shift in the conversation, we saw really rapid movement, which I think is parallel to, to what happened with this legislation. Like these problems and these ideas aren't new, but all of a sudden it became almost an emergency to, to try to address them. Um, one of the things that we're watching is, is whether this gets taken up in any other school districts. There's sort of one set of political um, considerations in Denver, but for example, Jeffco Public Schools has a really long history, I, obviously, um, you know, unfortunate history with, with violence in schools and a very different um, idea and relationship with their SROs. and have been big supporters of SRO programs, but even in some of the smaller suburban districts that serve, um, you know, predominantly students of color, there's also a different kind of relationship with, um, with their SROs. And so that's one of the things that we're watching to see if this picks up in any other districts or if it's, if it's remains a Denver phenomenon. Well, I just wanted to jump in and follow up with some of the things that Jesse said. I want to give kudos to our Jeffco Sheriff and our Jefferson County Police Chiefs. Um, the Jeffco delegation of legislators did a uh, phone conference with our Sheriff and our Police Chiefs the day that the bill dropped. And um, uh, we spent about an hour and a half in which they really gave us some good feedback on the bill. We were able to bring that feedback back to the sponsors of the bill, to Leslie Herod, who, um, to their credit, then we were able to see some of that, uh, those suggestions and changes made in the bill immediately. And that really helped with our sheriff and with our chiefs to, so that they felt like they were being heard. We received an email from um, our Jeffco Sheriff, Jeff Schrader, say, uh, thanking us um for the good partnership that we were able to form so they while i don't think they were a hundred percent happy they were um definitely feeling like they were heard um the question Je that jesse brought up about a small um law enforcement uh facilities and being able to afford the um body cams as and more so than the body cams is the storage because storage of those recordings is really expensive. So um, I've been talking with United Way about pulling together the foundations and that the foundation community to be able to come together and start having some conversations about how can they help support this whole endeavor. So we'll see what will happen with that. But the question of affordability is definitely on the table. So good point, Jesse, thank you. 
And we had one more question that was kind of aligned with 217. I thought I might kick it over to um, Andy. Uh, the question is, are, are you satisfied with how 217 got finalized given the modif modifications that were made to get it passed quickly? What elements of it uh, got changed or watered down that you feel need to be addressed further? And of course, um, I, I think that the the speaker here wants to hear like the legislative opinion, but um, I'm, I'm sure you hear a question in there, Andy, that you could probably address. <laughs> I think that in general, what we've heard from the advocate side is that it came through remarkably intact for something that got introduced only in the final weeks of the session. I think that Colorado was in a unique place to pass a bill like this, not just because of who's in the legislature, but especially because of the fact that we had a session going on right as these protests were happening. So the state ended up being very much in the spotlight, one of the first out of the gate. Um, you know, I can't speak too much to what was compromised on or what was sacrificed, but I think that it set a, a, a high watermark. And now, like Jesse and Representative Kraft Thorpe said, it's a question of figuring out how to execute stuff. How do you store those video files? Is there gonna be a uniform way to deal with that? Uh, where does the funding come from? What does being one of the first states to address this qualified immunity look like? So maybe a lot of the debate will end up happening on the, uh, the back end, but it did move through with quite a lot of bipartisan support. Um, it was definitely a, an inflection point for that. You're on mute, Trace. <laughs> You're still no, on mute. <laughs> no, no, no. That that one was on purpose. <laughs> I was trying to be trying to be funny. This is um, something that we're going to always remember from this period of time. Um, so let's switch gears a little bit um, to talk about another hot topic, and um, that this is a question that came up um, on the question and answer. Also, evictions, evictions, and foreclosures. So um, I know I have a lot of opinions about this, but Andy. Love to be able to hear your opinion around evictions and foreclosures. Um, I think the question was about what's being done and what's happened. And I'll just try to quickly walk through that. Evictions were effectively on freeze through the first couple months of the crisis, thanks to an executive order by Governor Polis. That's rolled off now and kind of the legal machinery of removing people from their homes for non-payment is starting to get moving now. So renters who are behind on payment could wake up tomorrow, today, and find a posting on their door that says, you got to pay up. What Governor Polis has done now is say that they effectively have 30 days to repay that. Normally, it's 10 days. After that 30 days, then we might start to see the first real kind of post-pandemic eviction cases moving forward. And that's been a, a really, really fraught topic for legislators. You've heard a lot of the, the uh, you've heard some lawmakers saying that they want to continue a total ban on evictions, keep people in their homes. But we've also heard concerns that that's a pretty, uh, a pretty significant intervention in the way that the real estate market works and what happens to landlords who are unable to keep up with their mortgages. So I would really watch out for that in the next month to see what volume of eviction cases, I'll be covering that closely, um, how that rolls out. One other thought on that is that it's gonna depend heavily on what happens with federal unemployment benefits. Those have been replacing a lot of people's lost income and keeping a lot of people afloat. It's actually, it's been a huge sum of money. And if those start to roll off potentially in late July, then we could see some real mismatches between how much money people have and how much money they owe. So that could be a crisis looming. We don't know yet. Good points, Great. yes. And so I think we really want to commend our joint budget committee and Rachel in that um, the, we have some general fund money that goes to helping with the um, eviction and housing assistance. Usually that's $750,000 they were able to minimize the cuts to that. So there's about 600,000. In addition, there's about 350,000 in CARES funding um, that was allocated. And one of the bills that's being signed on um, Monday morning is uh, uh, additional assistance of about 500,000. So 
the, the one piece of this is evictions and the doors opening around evictions. The other is there's a lot of money being allocated towards um, um, housing assistance. And so we really need to make sure that we're getting the word out to people that don't just not pay your rent, but you need to really pursue um, the assistance. The governor also um, did his executive order around moving to a 30 day notice rather than 10 days. So that will really give people more time to access some of that, that new funding. Anybody else want to talk about um, housing, housing and, evi and evictions and assistance? Jesse? Yeah, I mean, I know one thing that Andy was following closer than I was, and, and I don't know if he wants to talk about this, but you know, there, there was a push from some more progressive Democrats in the legislature to take more significant action on evictions and potentially codify the ban on evictions. And I, I want to say foreclosures as well. Um, and, that, and that didn't pass, it, it fell through, it didn't have it come up with enough votes. Um, you know, I think yesterday was kind of a, a good gut check. The state released its unemployment numbers percentage for May. And while it was down, uh, it was only down to 10% from 13, uh, 13, I think, percent. And, um, you know, that's, that's a lot of people that are out of work. I think one in six Coloradans, uh, Colorado workers has filed for unemployment since the coronavirus, um, you know, crisis began in the state. So I think there's a lot of unanswered questions about what the weeks and months ahead. Um, and I know that I was shaking my head about the special session because I don't want to do it, but I, I, I actually don't know if, if it might happen. And, and you know, I, I wonder if, if the economy tanks further, and, you know, even as people are going back to work, we're still seeing these, um, you know, this high unemployment rate. So I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, potential for more bad stuff to happen, unfortunately. So why do you think that the unemployment rate went down from 13% to 10%. Is that the result of the PPP dollars and um, people starting to bring people on as they're getting federal assistance? What do you think, Jeff? Did you do the yeah. investigative work around this? No, I mean, I guess uh, if you look at it though, it, it coincides like the end of April, people started, the, the restrictions on the stay at home order started to lift. So restaurants started to reopen slowly. You started to see barbershops and things like that. So as more businesses reopen, it would be, it would make sense that. Um, more people be back to work, but also, right, May was the, ent the entire month of May was essentially in this new phase where everybody could come back. And the fact that we only saw a 3% drop in, uh, in uh, unemployment, I mean, that, that shows you that uh, I think a lot of these jobs are potentially gone forever. So, uh, you know, I think PPP helped, but restaurant, restaurants told us that like it wasn't really geared towards them and they still had problems. And um, I don't think it was, I don't think it was, it helped a lot of people and, but I don't know if it was necessarily a silver bullet. Um, so yesterday we had, so yesterday we had the, the joint budget committee, we had our June quarterly forecast. And um, if you go online, you can see the, the economic and revenue forecast um, that, uh, that they did. <laughs> And um, and in it, uh, slide 18 or slide eight actually talks a little bit about how unemployment improved in May, but it still remains at um, historic highs. And if you look at the graph that they have in this, I mean, it's just really telling that this is our historical unemployment, um, you know, through through our, our recessions, and we are way up here, <laughs> um, and and it dipped. But when you think about where we are to compare to, to historically, yeah, it went down, but it's still really high. So it's, it's um, definitely something that we're gonna have to think about um, in going forward. Um, I wanted to jump to another question that we have here, um, which I think is an interesting question from um, a journalistic perspective. Um, the question is, there's a lot of political division across this country. Can you talk about how well you feel the two sides of the aisle worked together during this year's session? And I, I don't know who wants to take that one. Nobody, huh? <laughs> You know, we hate to pass judgment, but um, the I would say that the pandemic session moved a little bit faster than I expected and that it did seem as if, you know, obviously Democrats are in power and have most of the votes they need to do what they want, but we only saw so much delay tactics from Republicans. We only heard so many complaints. They did say quite a lot that they were 
blindsided by certain executive orders from the governor and that they were surprised at times by the scheduling of things that uh, take that for what you will. A lot of Republicans felt that they were caught off guard occasionally that say that police bill was coming up that day for discussion. But it seems like we didn't, it didn't turn into a kind of knockdown drag out fight. Like I was concerned that it might based on like the first couple of days of, uh, of the pandemic session. I'm also wondering too, if um, a lot of that division is what we see at the federal level and that the, the more you kind of come down to, to state politics or even local politics, the divisions are just not quite as dramatic. Um, that uh, I, I personally am, am optimistic about kind of the, the tenor or the, the culture around politics, the, the closer you get to, to local politics and state politics, where some of those divisions don't seem to be quite as um, sharp as, as they are at, at the federal level. Two quick thoughts on that. I think that you guys have less attention on you. Um, there's less pressure from social media, from cable news, but also, you know, state legislators, state legislatures are increasingly one party run. And I think it's easier to, to not have quite those kind of pitched conflicts when one party can kind of run the show. Personally, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 think, I think Democrats and Republicans in the Colorado legislature work better than maybe what you see on the national level. But I think at the same time, there's certainly a good deal of animosity, though it might be more like personality based than, than partisan based. Um, you know, one of the most interesting moments of the end of the session was, uh, you know, Rep Representative Dave Williams of Colorado Springs, who's like kind of a perennial thorn in, in Democrats' side, and he he drives Democrats crazy, and that's that's his thing. And he, uh, you know, went down to the well with Representative Kyle Mullica of North Glen, and they announced a deal on the vaccine bill, which was like, you know, I don't know, it was like the end of a world war or something. So. Um, you know, there, there's definitely a lot of room for compromise and those decisions get made. And, and I think, you know, I cover the Senate mostly and, and one of the best political operators, I think, in the Capitol is the Senate Minority Leader, Chris Holbert, um, who, who works really hard, I think, to try and make sure that there's, um, uh, you know, compromise and discussions constantly between Democrats and Republicans in the legislature. And I think another, you know, a good example of this was the work that was done on Gallagher this year, which I see there's a question on. And I think Erica is kind of the expert on that. So it might be a good segue. I don't know, just throwing it out yeah, there. Yeah, we, we were just talking about that. So um, if we want to skip to the next question, um, uh, it says, please address the Gallagher Amendment and why it was tackled and not Tabor. Uh, was the thought process that uh, this got to be referred? Um, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, well, so I think, um, uh, per Jesse's point, I think Gallagher is something that has a lot of bipartisan touch points where um, you can, Gallagher feels like a problem from a variety of political perspectives. For example, Senator Tate, who is the Republican co-sponsor in the Senate, um, he's very concerned about the impact on the business community of having to carry so much of this tax burden. Um, this has been... Um, a problem and it's a problem that affects rural areas more than it affects urban areas and so you have a lot of republicans who represent those areas who are concerned about the impact on their fire districts and their school districts the the other thing about gallagher i mean there's obviously been efforts to work to work on gallagher for years um and maybe this would have happened anyway but the other thing that's happening now is that gallagher because we're expecting this big drop in commercial property values we're expecting the residential to basically go into the, almost to the floor. Um, and that's gonna open up, it's gonna cost school districts almost half a billion dollars next year if something doesn't change. And significantly about half of that is something that the state is actually obligated to backfill. And so we already have all these funding problems in K-12 and you're about to put another $250 million burden onto the state if something doesn't change. So there's a lot of reasons um, to do something about it this year. Whereas Tabor, I think there's still a lot of, I think there's still a lot of popular support for Tabor. I, I would be very surprised if a Tabor repeal were to be successful. Um, 
And even the advocacy groups that had been talking about running a Tabor repeal um, decided this was not the right time to do that. And so, so even though I think particularly among Democrats, there's a widespread feeling that, um, you know, that, that Tabor should go, I, I don't think in the general public that's, that's as widespread. And I think that there's a lot of concern about putting something that controversial on the ballot and how does that affect all the other things that you're trying to do on the ballot. Um, that would be my guess with that. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's easier to agree to get rid of the thing that's about to knock the snot out of your budget, which is Gallagher. And the other thing is like Erica was, was getting at is this side effect of Gallagher where it's about to take a huge bite potentially out of the state and local budgets wasn't really what it was designed to do back in the 80s. It was designed to, you know, keep residential and commercial taxes in check. And the only reason it's having this super, um, one of the reasons it's having this negative effect now is that it's interacting with other laws like Tabor that were passed afterward. Tabor, meanwhile, still is mostly doing what voters wanted it to do when they approved it back in the 90s, which is put the power of approving new taxes in the hands of voters. So I think it's easier to agree to get rid of the thing that's kind of going off the rails and, and beating up your budget. Yeah, and also it's important to remember that in order to put something, constitutional amendment or constitutional change in the ballot, you need two thirds of the Senate and House uh, chambers. And while there was enough Republican support to do that with Gallagher, there's no way that any Republican would vote to put something on the ballot appealing Tabor. So anyone who wants to do that, uh, Colorado Fiscal Institute, looking at you, I, you know, that's, that's going to be expensive and they're going to have to gather the money on their own. And, and I don't even know if they're going to have support from a lot of Democrats on that, given that it's a fraught issue. I mean, there's certainly progressives want to get rid of Tabor. Yeah, there's no, like, that. that's how things work here in Colorado. But, you know, it's also something that voters like. And, and you know, every time, almost every time a tax increase goes on the ballot, it gets rejected in Jefferson County. Like, you know, your, your county budget's having problems because uh, the voters didn't want to, um, you know, make changes to Tabor that would have would have helped out, you know, the sheriff who's Republican who asked for the money. So it's just it's just a complicated, difficult issue. Um, and and yeah. Well, one last quick thought on that, if I can, um, is that voters seem vo voters seem to want to keep their power to approve tax increases, but in the past they don't. What am I trying to say? Um, the question is whether voters essentially want to allow taxes to ratchet down automatically. And in the past, they've shown some willingness to get rid of that ratchet down effect, um, including on Tabor. But yeah, voters giving up the power of raising taxes is a whole other question. But I th and think it is, is, oh. I'm so sorry, Erica. Um, I mean, this is somewhat related to a question that had popped up earlier around, um, did the legislature approve an emergency tax, for example? Yeah. Um, and, and it's somewhat connected. Um, and, and quite frankly, uh, you, we needed two thirds of, of the legislature to be able to do that. And we were barely able to muster up enough of a two thirds vote to be able to refer a measure <laughs> to the ballot to do that <laughs> um, uh, through to the repeal of, of, of Gallagher. So um, it, it, anything that touches Tabor um, definitely is a, a little bit more challenging, um, particularly uh, from a legislative standpoint. Um, to be able to even refer something to the ballot um, that touches Tabor is, is extremely um, difficult. So I'm sorry to interrupt you, Erica. No, I, I was I was going to make that point, and and I think the other thing is it's, it's not at all a sure thing that the Gallagher repeal will be successful at the ballot because um, it's a very complicated mechanism and the people who who oppose that are going to argue that this is this is it turns into an effective tax increase because you don't have this this limit in place anymore whereas the people who support it are going to have to make a more complicated case it's a it's a very complicated complicated um, provision and the way it has affected budgets is very complicated um, and and so oh, even though you were able to get the two thirds to refer it, I don't I don't think we know what's going to happen in November. Right. If voters don't know what what the ballot measure is, they tend to reject it in Colorado. So there are going to be um, a couple of other uh, 
ballot measures, um, one of which was referred uh, by the legislature on um, tobacco. Um, do you have any thoughts about um, those, those referred measures or some of the other efforts that are currently out there, um, such as the, the fair tax um, uh, effort? I mean, when we're talking about statewide taxes in Colorado, I, I do sort of start from the assumption that they're going to fail because that has been historically what has happened. I think the nicotine tax has a better chance, but I, I believe the only statewide taxes that have passed under Tabor have been on cigarettes or marijuana. Um, so um, there's a lot of people who have a sort of philosophical objections to sin taxes, but I think voters are more into them than, um, than maybe other kinds of taxes. And I also and think we there's- do. Yes, oh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> And I think there's um, also a lot more awareness now of the health issues associated with vaping. And so I think there might be interest in putting that tax on vaping products to bring the price up and hopefully reduce teen use of vaping. So I think that one has a better chance than the fair tax. The fair tax is, uh, for people who don't know, but effectively it's a progressive tax. We have a flat tax right now. Everybody pays the same income percentage. Uh, fair tax would raise it on top income earners. That message may resonate right now, but the measure is still going to read, shall taxes be raised X billion dollars, and most people don't get past that, so we'll see. That's either, depending on what your point of view is, it's either the most brilliant or worst, most evil part of Tabor, but it definitely complicates everything. I think, I think the tobacco tax will be super interesting. One of the things that I think is working in its favor is that since this was referred by the legislature, the people who are behind the ballot initiative, which would do a similar thing, which would have done a similar thing, now don't have to spend all the money to collect the signatures on that and now can put the money in toward, towards campaigning it. And, and we know that there are people with deep pockets, like the governor, who, uh, like Ken Theory, um, former CEO of DeVita, who have a lot of money and support this ballot initiative and, and could pump dollars into it. But again, shall taxes be raised is something that that stops voters in their tracks and you know people can spend millions and millions of dollars on on these these tax increase measures and it doesn't it, it hasn't mattered in the past and that phrasing is required by Tabor when you ask voters to raise taxes right. and um doesn't uh Tabor also require the the flat tax um which um, makes the um, progressive fair tax uh, initiative um, challenging because I think that makes it constitutional. So um, it has to receive a, a greater than 50% um, in order to, um, to happen. Is that correct? I think so, but I'm not sure right now because yeah, it's Saturday. Go to the Secretary's <laughs> website to answer that one. I think so. So the other questions we have on there. Um, around oil and gas, and part of it is the Colorado Sun apparently wrote an article in January, and I think that was based upon the audit report, wasn't it? But Jesse, it sounds like you stirred things up on oil and gas, so if you could kind of talk about um, oil and gas and, and why is the commission not doing anything, or what is the commission doing? Yeah, let me, I didn't write that, um, but let, I think I remember, yeah, okay, so that, you know, that report was passed with the intent, I think, of making changes. And, and Representative Kraft, are you on that committee that was on, that, that went before you? I remember talking to you about this. Yes. So, so yeah, I, I would, I am admittedly didn't follow that very closely. So I, I would, I think that there was changes made in order to prevent that from happening again. And certainly when an article like that comes out, people start having conversations, but that's definitely a good thing to, to chat about. Um, you know, oil and gas was not as much of an issue this year at the legislative session. There were certainly a few like clean air and clean water bills, but to be frank, they, they kind of fell from the wayside of our focus given everything that was happening with the coronavirus and social stuff, uh, social unrest stuff. So um, I know we just had a story in the sun uh, this week about air quality that you can check out. That's pretty interesting that I know ties in some oil and gas stuff. But you know the the Colorado Oil and Gas Commission is certainly working through the changes made in Senate Bill 181 in 2018, um, and there was a story that we just recently had by Mark Jaffe in the Sun that talked a little bit about some of the um, changes that were that were made that were pretty important. Yeah, this every oil and gas well in Colorado must be pressure tested annually under rules by past past regulators. That's meant to stop the. Um, uh, you know, the situation that led up to the Firestone explosion a few years ago from happening. So 
Um, yeah, we're going to be keeping on the, the COGCC just like everybody else. I think they, they ran into some troubles with coronavirus. Uh, I think we had another story that was talking about like, you know, rewriting the state's really complicated uh, controversial oil and gas rules over Zoom is like just as hard as anything. And, and, you know, just right now we're having these conversations where it's like somebody's on mute and what's happening and trying to negotiate those things, those really complicated things that I think have been difficult. But as, as things start to ramp back up and open up, I think we'll see more movement on those, on those regulations. Oh, Prove my point. Sorry. <laughs> so I will tell you that uh, one of the cost-saving measures that was proposed to us from the Department of Natural Resources, um, all the departments um, uh, offered up uh, budget cuts and, and um, budget saving measures, and one of those was to actually halt the rulemaking um, on, on oil and gas, and um, the industries themselves actually came forward and said, no, don't do that. Um, uh, they, they actually said, please go through the process of, of rulemaking uh, from Senate Bill 181. Do not um, stop that. Uh, we could have saved ourselves about $7 million if we had stopped the rulemaking on that, um, which would have uh, slowed down the implementation of 181. Um, so I thought it was very fascinating that um, the industries themselves um, uh, begged us not to do that and, and said, you know, it's going to be really important for us that we know what's what in, in the coming um, days. Also, um, so uh, we, we took them up on that. Um, so we have five minutes left. We, we actually have less than five minutes. Um, and I know that uh, Representative Tatone has to return her rental truck. Uh, <laughs> and so <laughs> um, I wanted to uh, give each of the um, journalists, just uh, the, our reporters here, an opportunity to do um, a short uh, wrap up, uh, a summary, um, something that you wanted to say that you didn't get an opportunity to say or the, a question that nobody asked you. And so, um, we'll kind of go in reverse order here and let's uh, kick it off with Andy um, since uh, last time you were you were last. Well I found out regarding the fair tax thing it does change the Constitution but for some reason because it's removing language it only requires 50 percent not 55. I learned something new. Um, I'll be I'll be following election stuff evictions unemployment for the next few months um, you can contact me anytime, A Kenny, A K E N N E Y at CPR.org. And uh, I'll be hopefully back for next session and using some of what I learned in this session because it is a complicated place. So thanks for having me. And we'll uh, move on to Erica. Yeah, I mean, I think just the funding picture is incredibly complicated and um, and and frankly, potentially devastating um, going into next year, depending on what happens. So that's going to be a huge focus for us. And, and I imagine a big focus of legislative action in the next session. And then in terms of other issues, we have a really strong equity focus at Chalkbeat and we will um, be continuing to report on um, you know, police and schools, on disparate um, discipline practices and some of the other factors that um, really prevent um, particularly black and brown children from getting the educational opportunities that they should and um, 